category is always my favorite category, and that's the effects edit. A story entered into this category must show how an editor uses effects to materially enhance a story. This could be as simple as using a wipe or as complicated as creating animations with another program such as After Effects or Motion. The best entries will have a seamless integration between these elements and the rest of the edit that enhances the overall story. Simply adding graphics to a story is not enough for this category. Your submission must include a write-up notifying judges of all elements that you did not produce, especially if you're using templates to achieve a particular effect. Entries must be 10 minutes or shorter. So this is category uh, 35. And so since this has longer uh, project descriptions where they are gonna be kind of listing out like timestamps and stuff. Uh, Sean, do you want us to handle caption reading any differently? No, just the same way. Okay, sounds good. Okay. I used no templates. Uh, 17 seconds, I created the bus and the baby carriage and drew and animated the text by hand. The background was montaged from several elements. 24 to 25, I drew slash animated the boy, I created the truck. 31 seconds, I created the boy slash girl and all the toys except the kite. 38 seconds, this is a montage. The hominids, Darwin, truck, and background are a montage of stock elements. 106 and 112, I hand animated the baby and the monkey. 144, the train cars are stock images and I drew slash animated the animals. 206, again, I created the footprint animation. I shot a playground at 207 with a GoPro and a long stick and raised up the stick. 211, I created slash drew this graphic animation, including the running man. Tuesdays without ceremony, the garbage truck comes and goes. But a few years ago at my house for Alex and Zach, garbage truck! Garbage truck! Garbage truck! it was what happened, Alex? an event. He did that. From the start, it seemed Quack. they were fans of heavy machinery. Bye. Researchers have scientifically confirmed Scoop. what many parents already know that while in general, young girls will play with a variety of toys, boys tend to choose boy toys, like trucks. Our hominid ancestors didn't drive trucks. So how, I wondered, could this be explained? What about playing with your house truck? Perhaps parents like Ali Detola. They love trucks. Just tell kids this. Like anything that moves, that goes with a motor is what they're supposed to play with. Did you tell them you're boys, so you should play with trucks? No, not at all. Or maybe they don't. Infants between the age of- Researcher Jerry Ann Alexander says, in fact, before a boy even knows he's a boy, his gaze will be drawn to these toys. And she says boys will be boys, even if they're monkeys. The monkeys showed almost exactly the same pattern. Researcher Kim Wallen found girl monkeys like plush toys. And boy monkeys really liked playthings with wheels. There's something else that that's driving this. There's no twins. Come on. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe my boy's thing for trucks and trains. A train. A train. Had something to do with the ability to track motion. There's another train over there. Theoretically inherited from ancestors who hunted. Boys have higher activity levels. More likely, says researcher Nora Newcomb, it's about the motion of the boys themselves. Beep, beep, beep. They just sort of move more, wiggle more. Yes. I'm going to dig all the way to the south pole. The constant movement. They travel more, even on a playground, because from the point of view of evolution, males are more expendable. They are going to be the ones who hunt, repel animals. Why boys like trucks? This, for a scientist, may be a clue about gender development. Is it really all a matter of context? Does the little girl or the little boy not bring anything to the table? And I think most parents know that it, that's not true. Perhaps they do come to the table with a few surprises, like... Woo! You found us up! You found us up! Garbage truck day.
uh, two two girls dream of making it big in the comic book and graphic novel industry. It is a daunting challenge that considering that profession has been criticized for its record of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The third artist seeks to show that it can be done and should be done. All panels, lines, and window box graphics and story were designed by Entrant. No plugins used. Only the two-tone backgrounds were contributed by the station's art department. None of this entry was done in After Effects. In a city on the side of a lake in Northeast Ohio. Super friggin' cool. Are three different artists. Ashley Riblet. I like really, really weird kind of lowbrow art. Roxy Conoff. I like making other people laugh with my drawings. And Shyla Sample Williams. I need like a lot of colors. All. It's just a great feeling committed to their craft. You can have something to say. Creating. But then you can also like express it visually. Comic book characters. I just love how the pencil just like curves. It's how I express my feelings in a way. Shyla and Roxy. <laughs> it's just fun. It's just great to be young. Be so carefree. Are the dreamers. Yeah, those are all comic books. Who dream of working in the comic book and graphic novel industry. Yeah. As a place to illustrate the injustices. I don't like discrimination. They see in the world. I don't like poaching either. It's, it's, it's just wrong. We're going to draw Batman again. The best way to tell a story, in my opinion, is to do comics. Through classes and by the way of conventions. It's not always like fictional or non-fictional. One minute to do it. Oh my gosh. Like the kids Comic Con. It could be educational, it could be anything. At Lake Erie Inc. Academy. Make sure it's loose. <laughs> Make sure it's sketchy. They learn. All right, these are some really good drawings, guys. From the pros. Whatever you dream up goes on the page. Then. Put that knowledge into the panels. It's super quick, like it just happens. Of their own storylines. It just matters that I let my ideas down on paper. Full of diverse heroes. Wolf ears and wolf tail and like a really cute outfit. Villains. Comic Zula is definitely my favorite bad guy. In virtue. A real hero is someone who stands up for the weak but the diversity they embrace hasn't always been there in the comic book business. One industry analyst has been tracking female employment at the two biggest comic producers. They found in 2018, less than 20% of the creators were female at DC and Marvel. In 2011, less than 10% of creators were women. Critics say they want more diversity at the top. I like all of the color I want. Ashley Riblet, the entire buffet of it, is a professional artist in Lakewood. Because that's what makes me happy. She says female artists have a strong presence in Cleveland. The majority of like women that I know, they've been doing it for like a long time. But the industry overall, yeah, you don't get the full pie chart unless you include women, needs more inclusion. It's not just one type of person on the planet. Like multitudes of different voices are important to have a well-rounded perspective. Which is something Ashley can represent. I still have to remind myself that like I am, I, I am a professional. Especially if the dreams of Roxy and Shyla are to become a reality. I make drawings and I sell them. They can look up to an artist like Ashley. Do gigs, I get freelance work. Who is succeeding in their chosen industry. I see amazing, powerful women, yeah. And see her. And nothing else. Drawing out a space for them already. In Cleveland, Caroline Sweeney, News 5.
It's described as the first major urban tragedy in America. On the night of December 26, 1811, about 600 people were enjoying a night of entertainment at the Richmond Theater. But following a small mishap on stage, the theater erupted in flames. Dozens would perish. This story follows the events of that night and the heroic efforts to tra save people trapped. Today, the historic Richmond Theater fire is called the 9-11 and the Titanic of its day. I used a combination of effects and post-production creative shooting to give the story life. Every interview was shot with multiple cameras so I could cut angles to keep the pace up knowing there, would, there was going to be limited video for this story. The pictures moving was done in After Effects with music and sound effects to really bring it to life. Then I printed the pictures out and physically shot them lit by just a flickering candle to give it the look of flames. The ashes and flames were overlays I put over the video to make it even more chaotic to go along with the story. I think I've been in any other church like this. Monumental church in downtown Richmond. Honestly, I don't think that most people driving by know what happened on this site. Danielle Worthing Porter with Historic Richmond says the building has been watching over East Broad Street for more than two centuries. I think that this site is really key to part of Richmond's history. But the reason Monumental was built overshadows the architecture. What happened on this site that night was one of the greatest tragedies that the city had ever experienced. Writer Harry Kolach Jr. says it is a sinister tale that still reverberates over the decades. December 26th, 1811. In the early 19th century, Richmond had a reputation for debauchery. Lots of gambling, best parties, um, best dancers. Historian Meredith Henny Baker says the Richmond Theater attracts large audiences. And the theater was a big part of the entertainment scene. It was wildly popular. On the night after Christmas 1811, an overcapacity crowd of 600 squeezes into the theater for a play. The audience, a cross section of Richmond, including Virginia's new governor, George Smith. It was uh, black and white, free and slave, uh, wealthy and middling class. But during a scene change, the night's revelry takes a swift and fatal turn. So a stage hand lifts the candles up into the fly, but the candles aren't extinguished. Part of the set in the rafters catches fire. And pieces of scenery start flaking down like snowflakes. It's pretty chilling. Performers scream dire warnings. The actor on stage is gesturing and saying, there's a fire. People are just watching him because they don't understand this isn't part of the show. Flickering flames erupt into an inferno. No, no, there was never any hope that this fire could be put out. People try pushing and clawing their way out. What several people mention is how quickly the place goes black. Doors that open inward and windows nailed shut create a death trap. You can also see people attempting to escape out the windows, dropping from the windows, some head first, some by their feet. The balcony collapsed, trapping many underneath it. Uh, and the, the, the exits were clogged, and uh, it, it was an enormous horror. I think it would have been a, a truly hellacious scene, horrible noises, desperation of hundreds of people trying to escape from this building. Using first-hand accounts, Miss Baker pieces together a timeline that awful night for her book, The Richmond Theater Fire. We have reports of people who froze, who couldn't move, who wouldn't leave despite the theater burning around them. During the calamity, Dr. James McCaw trapped inside and Gilbert Hunt, an enslaved blacksmith who ran to the scene, rise to the occasion. And they start lowering women through the window, the upst one of the upstairs windows. While many flee, the two strangers work in tandem. Once McCaw breaks the window open, he sees um, Gilbert Hunt down below and they set up this relay and they end up saving over a dozen women before McCaw is forced to jump out himself when he feels the flames at his back. The pair would forever be known as heroes of the Richmond Theater Fire. You know, we don't know the names of the women they saved. There are probably thousands of people walking around who owe their lives uh, to those two men on that night. Their brave actions, one of the lone bright spots during the disaster. The work that Gilbert Hunt and that Dr. McCaw did uh, stands out. But what is left? An unimaginable landscape. It was the largest urban tragedy to occur in the United States at that time, so it really was akin to like that day's 9-11. More than 70 people perish, teenagers, entire families, and Governor Smith. They created two giant mahogany coffins 
and they put all of the bodies together, male, female, black, white, enslaved, free. Everyone went in the coffins together. I try to be really respectful when I come down here. Historic Richmond's Danielle Worthing Porter says Monumental Church was built atop the final resting place. We are at ground zero. So this was the front yard of the theater. When it opened in 1814, Monumental Church served as a place of worship and a place to mourn. This, this is the crypt, and this is where 71 of the 72 victims of the theater fire are buried. This sacred ground is rarely open to the public. We are stewards of this site, of, of the crypt, of the building, and the site as, as a whole. This is one of the treasures here at the Library of Virginia. This is the playbill from the evening of the fire. Historian Meredith Henny Baker says for a decade following the fire, leaders banned stage performances in Richmond. And theater wasn't the problem. The building was the problem. As we approach the 210th anniversary, Meredith shudders to think the victims of the Richmond Theater fire died in vain. Many disasters that we encounter are preventable, and I hope that that encourages people to think deeply about what sort of meaningful activities can we do to prevent these things from happening over and over again in the future. For I Have a Story, I'm Greg McQuaid, CBS 6 News. Kelly Klein's whole life is thrown that she is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Determined to still teach her class even during a pandemic, she decides to do distance learning with them while she does chemo each week. This whole story was done by a Zoom and conceptualized into a visual, virtual world. Every edit is key frame to give the appearance it is happening in real time. <sighs> School in a classroom. I have 14 now in the waiting rooms. Teacher in a box. It's my dad popped on. And 21 kindergartners are where their online experience is also defined. Hey, Mrs. Klein. By what's beyond the screen. You're at the doctor's house. Of Kelly Klein. I am at the doctor's house. You're right. The doctor's house is five-year-old speak for Lakes Medical Center, Wyoming, Minnesota. Hello. Hello. Where this morning, the kindergarten class from Falcon Heights Elementary has accompanied their teacher to chemotherapy. Woo woo. Go Raina, go Raina. They're helping me be strong because it's real easy to um, go down the why me. Kelly has every right to go down that road. A 32 year teacher at the same school she attended, a wife and mom who first battled ovarian cancer five years ago, then went back to her life until cancer found Kelly again. She had a really bad feeling that something might be up. Something cruelly confirmed on the fifth anniversary of Kelly's last chemo treatment. Now that it's returned, it's not curable, it's terminal. So what to do next? Uno, dos, tres. Show your board. She is my inspiration every day. Beth Banky, school principal, knows most in Kelly's shoes, would take a leave. Take a look at your recording sheet. <laughs> Kelly came to me and said, please don't make me. I said, absolutely not. Let's figure it out together. Parents were notified their children would see nurses coming and going. It's amazing to watch it. Cliff, did you have a different idea? Opening doors for discussion. I think it might turn yellow a little bit. Between Cliff Fergus and his parents. She has cancer. She has cancer. What are they, what are they giving her when she's there? Um, treatment. Treatment, what is that? Like some kind of medicine? Yeah. Congratulations, lucky duck. The chemo won't cure Kelly. The aim to slow her cancer down. The last time around, I had a posse of friends that went with me to chemo every week. And with COVID, I can't have that. So what better way to spend four or five hours than with five-year-olds? Your new posse. Yes, exactly. 
Kelly's hair and eyebrows are starting to thin. The gingerbread girl. A topic she'll soon be addressing with her class. I, I want them to see that cancer isn't a death sentence. Woo, woo, woo. You can still be happy and playful and silly and funny and energized. Abe, do you have something to share? It's a Lego Star Wars toy. Abe's mom, Sarah Durdowski. Couldn't have asked for a better teacher. Um, I can't imagine what she would do in person <laughs> if she can do this from there. Ready, scientists? You are looking good. I give them a lot of cheers. I'm their best cheerleader. Woohoo! So that they can they they can know that they can do anything in this world. Maybe they'll invent a cure for cancer. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And they'll think of you when they do. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Wowie, wow, wow, scientists. Kelly Klein. That was so smart. Teaching while she teaches. All right, I'll see Bye, you in... Boy Duford, Carol Evan News, Wyoming. Bye-bye. Lending is more than just business. It's also about race. We've been crunching new numbers and we're finding Blacks and Hispanics are being denied home, home loans at much higher rates than whites, even when they have a similar ability to repay. It's part of a larger pattern of economic injustice for low-income communities of color south of Interstate 30, which is a dividing line in Dallas and the subject of an ongoing WFAA investigative series, Banking Below 30. All graphics, including Franchise Open, created by me in After Effects. Map graphics made with the aid of GeoLayers plugin. Vector art at 235, 326, and 616 licensed from Adobe stock. Images were tweaked in After Effects and effects were added to help them look more hand-drawn. The credit score has become, in many ways, a, a proxy for race. When it comes to making loans, the law says lenders are supposed to be colorblind. Black, white, Hispanic, as long as you can pay the loan back, they can't treat you any differently. Jennifer Baker doesn't believe that's how it really works. I think when people think of this side of downtown Dallas, that this is low income uh, or people who don't want to work and who don't want to pay their bills, whereas that's not, the, that's not the case. Baker is a nurse, a homeowner, and she's been a customer with the same bank since 1999. But over the years, Baker says her bank has made it hard or impossible to get credit, so she had to turn elsewhere for her $89,000 home loan. I can't walk into my bank and ask them for money. Not give it to me, loan it to me. I'll pay you back. I pay everyone else back, no problem, but they're the only one that does not seem to trust me. As we've reported over and over again, Banks in Dallas make relatively few loans to the low income and minority communities that live below Interstate 30. Some people are telling me that's just good business. Why should banks be required to loan money to people that cannot pay them back? They only lend to people who qualify. Banks will loan to green Martians if likely to be paid back. But the reality is this is about more than just business. It's also about race. We've been crunching the numbers and we have found that blacks and Hispanics are denied loans at much higher rates than whites, even when they have a similar ability to repay. To analyze denial rates in mortgage lending from banks and mortgage companies, we collaborated with the nonprofit Reinvestment Fund, which focuses on advancing economic justice. And we started by looking at denial rates for all applicants in Dallas in 2019 and 2020. And while this kind of public data doesn't include all the factors a lender would consider, we found whites are denied for mortgages 5.8% of the time, blacks 16.1, and Hispanics 13.8. That means in Dallas, if you're black, it's three times more likely 
you're going to get denied for a loan. So what happens if we run those numbers again, but now instead of looking at all applicants in Dallas, we just look at more qualified people. If they've got enough savings for a down payment of 10% or more and enough income to pay their debts with close to 60% of their paycheck left over. Well, of these more qualified applicants, we found whites are denied 4.3% of the time, blacks 12.1 and Hispanics 5.8. So even when they're more qualified, blacks are still three times as likely to get denied. And here's an even more interesting finding. Look at the denial rate of less financially qualified whites. It's 12.2%. So if you're keeping score, if you're more qualified in black, you'll be treated about the same as someone who is less qualified and white. What's missing in all that information are credit scores. Those aren't public, so we can't see that data. But we do know that carrying a lot of debt can be bad for your credit score. And we also know that high debt is a problem that's much more common for black families than it is for whites. Black and brown communities are always going to be behind because we've been systematically held out of accessing credit, which is- Jeremy Greer is the co-founder of the nonprofit group Liberation in a Generation. He recently testified in Congress for credit score reform, and he's got a big problem with credit scores. Why is your opinion that that's what's driving this, the credit score? Well, credit scores are inherently biased. What research shows with, with black households is that the higher your income, the more debt you have. And what's a real driver of that debt for like middle income black people is student loan debt. So there are things that stack against black or brown communities that make the system in which they use to determine the credit score inherently biased against black and brown people. The Urban Institute analyzed federal data and found one third of blacks don't have a credit score, also known as a FICO score, because of a lack of credit history. Another third has a credit score that's poor to fair, 14% have a score that's fair to good, and only 20% have a score that's good or better, compared to 50% of whites. In Dallas, that looks like FICO scores in white neighborhoods that are on average 156 points higher than in black ones. The FICO score is not the only predictor of default risk. And yet the FICO score historically has been used in making those decisions. Ben Struby opened a small mortgage business after quitting his job at a big bank. He was disillusioned about the emphasis on catering to people with healthy credit scores and overlooking borrowers with lower credit scores who might still qualify for a loan, but were less profitable and more time consuming. Bigger banks are cherry picking um, high net worth clients. You know, the big bank offers wealth management services. They offer uh, CD accounts, checking savings. They want you for the life of your loan. And so if you've got a 620 FICO score, do you have money to invest with them? Probably not. What do the banks have to say? Well, the trade group, the American Bankers Association, points out it has successfully lobbied for ways to lower barriers to minority home ownership, like the removal of strict caps on how much income an applicant uses to pay off debt. It also supports reforming how credit scores are calculated. Right now, for example, rent, utility, and mobile phone information are only on your credit report if you miss a payment. But these are major expenses, and Greer says families should also be getting credit when they make on-time payments. It's an idea that's getting some traction in the mortgage industry, but still has a long way to go. Homeowners are consistently getting their on-time payments reported to credit bureaus, while renters who are disproportionately low income do not. Our money spends the same. Back to Jennifer Baker, who has an excellent credit score and is currently working on her master's degree. She hopes it's gonna help her get ahead, but she'll also graduate with $30,000 of debt to go along with her weariness about the bankers who've previously written her off. That's baloney, that because we live in this area, we can't afford to pay back our money or our credit scores aren't good enough. The bottom line here is that if you're black or Hispanic, it is just harder to get a loan. And saying that that's just how business works ignores the much bigger picture. We have a financial system that lays out obstacles to prosperity depending on the color of your skin.
In Dallas, I'm David Schechter reporting. A bank is supposed to do two things, collect deposits and make loans, and many do, if you live in the right part of town. Banking Below 30, WFAA's ongoing investigation of banking practices has found that south of Interstate 30, where most of the residents are Black or Hispanic, many bank branches take deposits, but the same banks don't lend much back out to customers in the surrounding neighborhoods. Map graphics were made with the help of GeoLayers, a plug-in for After Effects. I had to find four... I had to find format the geodata of every bank within the city of Dallas on a spreadsheet and then input that data into GeoLayers to be able to map all the banks. That was then cross-referenced with census tract data that also imputed into GeoLayers. Formatting of the geolocations and animations is done through GeoLayers slash After Effects. All other graphics, including the franchise open, were created by me in After Effects. A bank is defined as a financial institution licensed to receive deposits and make loans. But when you live below I-30, which is largely black and Hispanic, that's not how it works. Sure, banks take deposits, but we found the branches aren't lending much money back out. So we're going to do stripes next to colors, put it solid there. Can you change those two? All right, put that one here. The first time Traswell Livingston tried to buy a home in South Dallas, three banks turned him down. Very frustrating, very disheartening. Um, makes you build up a thick skin. Today he owns a home on an historic block near Fair Park where he says many neighbors don't trust banks. So much discouragement of the bank that they don't even use it or even inquire anymore because they just don't think it's even possible to get a loan. Without home loans, there's no home ownership. And home ownership is an important way for parents to build up and transfer assets to their children. It's an avenue that research shows is missing for many black families. According to the Federal Reserve, by age 55, the rate of home ownership among blacks is 32% lower than it is for whites, and the homes that black families own are worth 35% less. These are key factors behind the racial wealth gap, which hardly exists for young people, but by 75, median wealth for a black family is $46,000, but $302,000 for a white family. Livingston is concerned about some of his neighbors who've lived here for decades and are desperate for a small loan to keep up their properties. But most of them know that you know, that's not gonna happen. Patch it up, close off the door, don't go in that room, and you know, keep moving. And do it with cash. Do it with cash or don't do it at all. In the northern half of Dallas, there are 296 bank branches. In the southern half, there are 55. But 43% of the city's population lives in southern Dallas. That's 560,000 people. And our analysis shows they only get 26% of the home loans. The banks that do have branches in southern Dallas, how are they performing? Neighborhoods in DFW are broken down into census tracts. The one that Livingston lives in includes a Bank of America and a Chase Bank. Government records show in 2018 and 2019 those companies made zero loans in this track. But let's take a little wider view. We clustered the track with adjacent tracks to create an area with a population of about 30,000 people that a bank branch might serve. Over two years, Chase made 16 loans in this cluster and Bank of America made 19. By comparison, six miles away in a cluster with the same population, including a Chase and a Bank of America in Lakewood, Chase had 171 loans. Bank of America had 143. That's a smoking gun. John Taylor is a fair lending advocate with the National Community there, Reinvestment Coalition. Should banks be investing in creditworthy borrowers in South Dallas, if they can show they can pay these loans back, that they earn enough income, should the banks be doing it? 
And the answer is, of course. And the answer is, yes, that's the law. And what's the big picture of North Dallas versus South Dallas for the area's three biggest banks, Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo? Well, for Chase's northern branches, there were, on average, 102 loans around each branch. In the south, there were 32. Around Bank of America's northern branches, the average was 67 and 23 down south. And Wells Fargo had 65 in the north and 18 in the south. In a statement, Chase writes it regularly ranked first or second in Southern Dallas for all mortgage lenders and typically ranked first among banks. However, we recognize that too many people are not sharing in the region's prosperity. In Southern Dallas and within communities of color, we know we can do better. Bank of America says loan data from 2018 and 2019 doesn't capture the bank's more recent affordable home ownership initiative in Southern Dallas, which has recently lent $75 million to 365 low to moderate income borrowers and made $4 million in down payment grants to first time home buyers. Wells Fargo noted on its bank exams, its distribution of loans to low to moderate income borrowers exceeded the aggregate lending and received a rating of good despite affordability challenges in Dallas. If the regulators just raise the question, gee, you only made four or five loans in all of South Dallas, what the heck is going on here? That's what examiners, regulators are supposed to do. They won't do it, unfortunately, unless somebody makes an issue of it. Big banks are regulated by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, in a statement, the OCC says examiners do not have the authority to require a bank to make mortgage loans or to make such loans in a specific area. It also noted other neighborhood factors should be taken into consideration when looking at loan data, like the level of owner-occupied housing, income level, market volatility, and population trends. Bank of America Chase, any of them, if examiners started asking questions about the, the lack of commitment, the lack of level of loans to low and moderate income people in neighborhoods, uh, they'd, they'd sit up and pay attention. They really would. Remember that definition of what a bank is? Well, there's another important word in there, license. The government grants banks the right to operate and make their big profits, but in exchange, there are rules, including the Community Reinvestment Act. It's a powerful federal law that says banks are required to meet the credit needs of the entire community and reinvest in the minority neighborhoods they've long ignored. We have to confront their greed and, and, and that's, that's, what, that's what they suffer with. They suffer with greed and racism. Diane Ragsdale is a former Dallas council member who runs a nonprofit helping working families achieve home ownership. The law was created for a reason because banks refused to lend to low to moderate income communities. But and that so, law doesn't work unless so, the people in those communities use the law. Right? That is correct, sir. And so, and that's where a movement comes into play. In the 80s, Ragsdale successfully used the Community Reinvestment Act to pressure banks to make more loans. In the early 90s, she says community pressure is what got the Chase and Bank of America near Fair Park built. And today, she says, pressure can work again. If you have an institution there, what, what, what is your role, just to sit there and do nothing? Um, or just to sit there and receive deposits? No, your role is to get out there and develop relationships with the people, uh, communicate with the people, and determine what I can do to, to meet your lending needs. In order to get banks to live up to their legal obligations, make loans in the neighborhoods in which they operate and play a role in closing the racial wealth gap, Ragsdale says an organized community movement is what's needed now. We're more than willing to publicly embarrass you at, because you have, in, in essence, uh, uh, disrespected us and, and, and our needs. In Dallas, I'm David Schechter reporting. A bank is the
Japan's most popular dog was shot as a part of a series of feature stories that aired during the Tokyo Summer Olympics Games coverage. Note, the story was shot prior to the pandemic, but was edited and broadcast in 2021 due to the postponed Olympic Games. Japan is a photographer's dream. The colors, just the atmosphere, the warmth that you feel when you're here. Once we start taking images, it's so beautiful, you know. It's easy to compose images. It's an endless source of inspiration. It's no wonder that social media is filled with spectacular photos of the Olympic host country. No matter how hard I try to shoot everything, the next day I wake up and I go to the same place I've been to a thousand times and I discover something fresh. But in Japan's crowded online space, the most unique buzz might just be coming from this unassuming Tokyo man and his favorite photo subject. Konnichiwa. え、小野真次郎と彼は、え、11歳の芝犬です。彼のこうスマイルというか、笑顔が人々の心を。Maru can't seem to go anywhere in Tokyo without drawing attention. This is the famous Shiba dog in Japan. Shinjiro Ono found Maru at a pet store 11 years ago, saying the puppy was probably ignored because he had a round body. Shinjiro bought the puppy on Christmas Eve and named him Maru, which means the circle. They became inseparable. Shinjiro started posting photos of their adventures on Instagram. Photos of the smiling Shiba seem to connect with people. Maru now has two and a half million followers on Instagram. Okay. Yeah, I will The dog's popularity probably explains why this man wandered over during my interview. <laughs> there is a market for Maru. Karendo? Quite literally. Costa. Posters. Yes. Maru's face. Towel. A towel. Yeah. Maru's towel. Yep. Is on everything. And right. Maru beer. <laughs> Maru beer. <laughs> Maru has become a revenue generator, but not for his owner. The round dog once ignored in a pet store now has his own shop. His smiling face, who once couldn't get anyone's attention, now gets 200,000 views for a post like this one. And Maru is impacting his owner. It's been quite a ride for Maru a puppy that came from humble beginnings to become Japan's most popular dog. The Art of Sushi was shot as a part of a series of travel features aired during the Summer Olympics in Tokyo. 
Note, the story was shot prior to the pandemic. However, it was edited, broadcast, and distributed on digital platforms in 2021 due to the rescheduled Olympics. Nighttime in Akihabara. The bustling district of Tokyo is the home of electronic stores, maid cafes, and anime. Lots of anime. For fans of the Japanese comic art style, this is an immersive paradise. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that inside this Akihabara restaurant, <laughs> there's a real-life character <laughs> whose animated personality <laughs> and remarkable story <laughs> fits perfectly into the panels of the comic book world that surrounds her. Let me explain. You see, Yuki is a trailblazer in Japan a chef who made history. For a long time, all of the sushi chefs in this country were men. His father was known as the best sushi artist in, in Aomori. And now in his generation, he's carrying it to the next level. Generations of men preparing, creating, and serving Japan's famous raw fish and rice. Yuki went to art school but couldn't find the perfect job. So she decided to chase a dream. で、お寿司が大好きだったことに加わって、it was not an easy path for Yuki. She once faced scrutiny from male customers and other sushi chefs. As I visited sushi restaurants across Japan, I learned why men dominated this industry for so long. Women have a higher body temperature than men, so they were not considered good at making sushi because their hands would be too carry too much heat. Your hands have to be as low temperature as possible to keep preserve the freshness of the fish. Her sushi has an artistic flair. It is butterfly. <laughs> Akihabara has that energy, fueled by the people who come here for electronics, anime, and great food. Wow, that looks great. Japan's sushi story has featured many men. But now, thanks to Yuki Shidui, the chef character is being redrawn. This time, it's a woman taking the lead. Nat Geo explores why Will's world is a world of sound, and Nat Geo explores why electric planes will be the next great challenge. For National Geographic Media, Nat Geo explores features scientists and historians explaining in fascinating detail everything from the connection between germs and diseases to how we became obsessed with Mars. Each episode aligns with National Geographic's coverage plans and brand priorities, packaging, expert interviews, energetic visuals, and often humor into in informative storytelling that appeals to the contemporary social and digital audience the National Geographic strives to reach. Why Will's World is a World of Sounds. Uh, several decades after a groundbreaking album of whale songs first peaked public curiosity and started a global conservation movement, scientists continue to decode the wide array of vocalizations different whale species use to communicate. In the 1970s, 
a new type of music started to gain worldwide attention. It didn't have catchy lyrics or feature dreamy heartthrobs. Actually, it sounded like this. These are whale songs, and there's probably more to them than you'd think. Humpback whale songs were actually first recorded through the US Navy in the 1950s. And they were like, what is this? We can hear these very strange sounds. Later in the 1960s, they actually started to be analyzed by researchers in the field. An acoustical biologist, Roger Payne, lowers special underwater microphones to record their songs. They figured out that it was humpback whales singing. And after that, it just opened up this massive interest in research. By 1970, a marine biologist named Roger Payne released a five-track album called Songs of the Humpback Whale. It went multi-platinum. And fun fact, National Geographic even included copies inside one of its 1979 issues. Oh yeah, and it also started a global movement. At the time, whaling was still happening. But when the world started to hear these whale songs, then there kind of was a change in feeling towards whaling. And eventually you had the whaling moratorium to stop it in many places in the world. And that's allowed whales to recover. Maybe you could attribute that to people hearing their songs. Those songs inspired decades of research, not just about humpback whale songs, but about how many different whale species talk to each other. The ocean is a totally different place than humans are used to. It's deep, it's enormous, and most of the time it's dark. And that's why a whale's world is a world of sound. Sperm whales communicate with one another using a system of clicks. They use clicks to echolocate just like a bat does in the darkness. But when they're talking to each other, they make really patterned series of clicks that we call codas. Animals that live in different clans, the coda patterns that they use are unique to them. Animals that live off Dominica make a coda that we don't hear anywhere else in the world, and it sounds like this. The one plus one plus three. That's unique to animals in the Caribbean, and we think that it serves for them to say, I am from Dominica, are you? I never modify my accent. I merely slow it down. So just like an accent might give an idea where someone's from. West Texas! Whale dialects are cultural connections to their families, even when far from home. Sperm whale families are matrilineal. That means it's grandmothers, mothers, and daughters that'll live together for life. The young males will learn their natal dialect, and then they leave their family and travel enormous distances and undoubtedly bump into sperm whales that speak different dialects than them. But what about their families back home? Living in those same waters are animals that are from a different clan, and so a different dialect. And that way, they're able to live in a multicultural part of the ocean, where dozens of families live in the same area. That's really important because it highlights this sense of belonging that people only think humans have. Now let's get back to those singing whales. When it comes to whale song, especially humpback whale song, it's this extremely complex acoustic display. The smallest continuous sound to the human ear is called the unit. And these range over different frequencies. So you get really low ones like barks, some high ones such as like squeaks and trumpets. And then you have a stereotype sequence of units that forms a phrase. And then these phrases are repeated to form a theme and successive themes create a song. In each breeding location, all the males sing the same song any given time. But that song also changes gradually over time. One individual might make an embellishment. One of the trumpets might lengthen and then split into two. Or they might just stop singing the trumpets altogether and replace them with some barks. 
And so this happens in Atlantic Ocean and happens in other places in the world, but something really strange is happening in the South Pacific Ocean where you've got these migratory pathways. Individuals from different breeding groups come into acoustic contact and researchers have found that in one year you were seeing this one song displayed in, say, Tonga, and a couple of years later you're seeing that song displayed in French Polynesia. And so it's kind of like this ripple effect where they totally replace in quite a short time scale their songs. And why that is, isn't completely known yet. But we can say that as the songs evolve, all of the individuals within that particular population will update their songs so that they maintain conformity across the population. In the 1970s, whale songs inspired change. Today, conservationists hope learning about whale cultures will do the same. Through understanding their cultures, we can better conserve them because we go beyond mere numbers within a population, but towards conserving their individual cultures. If we're going to be good stewards of the ocean, we need to think about cultural diversity as important as genetic diversity. These cultures are how these animals are surviving. The secrets their grandmothers are teaching them are the secrets that allow them to survive for generations. Airplane emissions from jet fuel usage are projected to climb as more and more planes enter the sky. A future without planes seems unimaginable, so we need to rethink how they fly. This could usher in the next wave of aviation driven by electric power. Flight. It moves us, our goods, and honestly, kind of everything. How it moves has also changed from one propulsion system to the next. So is what we're used to enough? Or are we about to see a new type of propelled flight? One that's electric. Propulsion really drives the design of aircraft. I think we're seeing the third wave of propulsion, which is going to bring on the third wave of different types of aircraft. It's a really exciting time. Dr. Pat Anderson is the director of the Eagle Flight Research Center at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. The first airplanes were driven by piston engines, and so those were sort of straight wing, slower aircraft. And then in World War II, we saw the advent of the jet engine. It's the world's first warplane with jet propulsion. The look of airplanes changed significantly as we went from piston-driven airplanes to jet airplanes. We saw very sleek airplanes that went very quickly. It will do the job of several of the biggest propeller-driven planes. And now we're looking at the third wave. I don't think you're going to see a lot of retrofits of electrical propulsion into older aircraft. What I think you're going to see is an entirely new generation and look of airplanes. No matter the look, in order to fly, you need energy. That could come from batteries one day. But today, it comes from jet fuel, and there's a reason why. Jet fuel is nearly the perfect package to hold energy. If you look at the specific energy of liquid fuels, it's 7.3 horsepower hours per pound. And right now, the pack level of battery is about 0.1 horsepower hours per pound. That's off by 73 times. It's not 73%, it's 73 times. So that's quite a gap. But liquid-fueled aircraft, only about 30% gets translated to thrust. In a battery electric airplane, that's nearly 80% efficiency. So when you take that into effect, that 73 times gets knocked down to only about 20 times, which is still quite challenging. The good news is that batteries are getting better with time and liquid fuels aren't. Leaving us with? Right now, we have a rising carbon footprint from aviation. Tarek Weeks is the chief engineer at Elroy Air, where they're developing autonomous cargo aircraft. People have greater economic means who are able to use more carbon. Meaning, more people checking in. 
Only around 20% of the world's population has ventured into the skies, but that's going to nearly double by 2035. The key thing here is that we need to, over time, reduce the footprint of these systems, and we need to get to a point where we're not seeing this upward trend we're emitting. Getting rid of planes isn't an option, so we need to change them. Batteries are really interesting because they hold the promise of being very environmentally friendly, but they're quite heavy. So that provides a challenge, especially in aviation, which is very weight centric. That challenge? If an airplane needs more power, you need to add more batteries. But batteries make the plane heavier, so you need more energy. Therefore, you add more batteries, which adds more. Oh, OK. We can move on. We need to drive the weight of those batteries down. And so the research in aerospace is focused on that particular metric. To start, aviation could follow the playbook of a different kind of vehicle. What we're moving towards and what companies like Elroy Air are working on is making hybrid power plants. So your Prius per se. This hybrid approach could start small, focusing on flights less than 500 miles a range making up half of the world's commercial routes. We have a long way to go to get a pure battery electric plane across distances such as the Atlantic. But for things such as regional travel, what I think we're gonna see is hybrid electric bridge that gap before we make these giant leaps and bounds. It's no giant leap, but still a significant step that allows engineers the opportunity to test batteries in an aircraft hybrid electric system use that battery power to get off the ground. So we're able to get a more fuel efficient system. And when you cruise more efficiently, you burn less carbon. A Prius, a Chevy Volt, any hybrid car, that's exactly what they do. They use that battery to get up to speed. And then by making all the components more optimal, they're able to drastically reduce the amount of fuel you burn. And that's effectively what we're trying to do in an aviation sense. Electric flight gives us hope for greener skies, but it could also bring the arrival of an entirely new type of flying machine. It's an automobile on its way to a hangar to become an airplane. No, not quite. With the current economics, a flying car from a personal standpoint probably isn't viable. But if you take that aircraft, you spread it out over many uses each day, like a taxi, there are a lot of people that speculate we can bring the cost of this down to the higher end Uber type models. With autonomous aircraft that don't require a runway, companies like Uber see these futuristic commutes as a possibility. But if you're wondering how this is different from this, we might have an answer for you! You could just imagine in a city if we had 10,000 helicopters operating around. That would be annoying. Noise is one of the critical aspects of being able to deploy urban air mobility and air taxis. And that lends itself to high torque, low RPM electric motors, aircraft that are really, really quiet. Transporting people safely is the goal but using these new technologies to deliver supplies could be just as vital. There's a potential humanitarian aspect of this. You're seeing more and more of these instances where you have infrastructure failures or there is need for rapid distribution. Eliminating the need for a runway and operating autonomously would give these aircraft the ability to connect to isolated areas, providing much needed supplies such as water or medicine to those in need. What everyone wants to know is when will I be able to book a ticket on an electric aircraft? I'm excited to see this happen sooner rather than later. I think what I see in the future is a mix of traditional aircraft and these newer types of aircraft. That's where the industry needs to go. And I want to give a stepping stone for the future as well. Okay, that's it for Editor Effects.
I have like a top four, but not in an order. The garbage trucks, sushi, three artists, and banks refuse to lend, but I haven't put them into an order yet. You said garbage trucks, three artists? Yeah. The art sushi one and the banks refused to lend. Those stood out to me. Banks refused to lend was the second one from that guy, right? Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. To, to, to me, um, I think if we're judging by complexity of special effects, right? And the use of special effects for a story, as much as I loved everything about the trash truck, everything. I mean, I have a boy, so everything. <laughs> Um, I think that in terms of complex complexity, the the second story we watched with uh, the uh, comics was a more complex execution. And so it, if we have to go by that, then I would go with that number one and the dump trucks number two. I think I'm still sort of split on the sushi story if I feel like the theme was forced or it like amplified the story. Um, well, I, I wrote down that I thought it, to me, it was almost insulting. Like she's some kind of comic book. It was That was I, in my head of like, is this? I was like, if, if she's the first sushi chef, she's more than some anime character. Yeah, that was in my head. Of that's what, yeah, that's what came across to me. It just... I mean, I guess my thought was if if she's some kind of hero, like an anime character, they didn't drive that home enough to me. That didn't come across is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they minimized her impact on the industry by making her a cartoon character. Um, and my other concern is frankly, I mean, they are the network. And so un unless you tell me that that is the photographer who did it i mean i yeah. would say this would be a contract was they, it no no because in the story before he was wearing it was the wthr like logo polo from that's the indianapolis nbc yeah so oh, indianapolis that, station okay i'm just assuming it's steve Rhodes. and then then yeah then then we I'll, I'll give him grace and i'll step away from my harping on the networks and they have more resources bandwagon um but the thing is, we're not supposed to judge them by the fact that they minimized her. Yeah. Well, uh, we can judge the right? fact we're that we're not we judging felt, the um, well content of the story. But we're supposed to judge in the way they used it. Did it work? And I say, for that reason, the answer is no. Okay. So I mean, I support that. Whether you dissolve then into I, it, wipe yeah. into it, or it's just out of place. <laughs> it's, I don't. It's content, and I don't know if it works. I, yeah. I see their effort. I understand why they were building, you know, they built it anime because so much of it is anime. But yeah, anyway, I, I agree with you. Then the would you, did we say the second story, the WFA David Spector story, the bank lending, the second one, right? That had mm -hmm. more. And those those actually yeah. helped me understand a lot more. The first story, the, the, the graphics from mm -hmm. FA were confusing to me. The second one, on point. I was like, because they really took the compare and trust next to each other and it popped to me. Right. Yeah. Let me throw a wrench in the whole thing. Let me just ruin all of this that we just did. I mean, at least, no, no, the end of it, the latter end of it. Let me just throw the Boyd cancer story. And here's why. When he, this is the Zoom, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Full disclosure, I've seen the story before. Uh, it was shown at the NPPA workshop that I was teaching in October. And the reason why I wanna bring this up is I liked how they did the Zoom because it was a creative way to do the Zoom and taking the Zoom all the way, right? You can do a graphics, you can do some sort of, you know, we've seen lots of like things in the phone and whatever else. Like they used 
Zoom and the clicking and the movement of screens as a storytelling tool. And I respect that. I mean, to me, that is frankly harder to come up with than leaning on a graphics in an investigative story, right? I mean, an investigative story will probably have some sort of graphics. How you execute them, we can debate. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as a a creative way to approach something that did not have all the other things that we, we judged in the number one and number two. Take it away. Who's going to poo poo me first? I will. <laughs> I, I do agree that they. I they, love it. No, they, they did use a creative way to use the windows and, and in their native environment. Um, but it wouldn't have hurt. Like when they're clicking through the photos, half of it, I wanted to see the next photo because that was the last thing my eye saw and I never got to see. So they had to wait till the next click. So it confused me at first. They could, they could have done a little treatment where they cropped it out and trimmed it up and put a blur in the background and it still would have been in the native environment. I would have been, and, and that would have helped me focus on what I was looking at. But without that, with a window to the left and a window to the right and things moving, I was, was really got really busy for me. So I thought a little treatment could have helped that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if they could have done it differently in, in, in the native place it was, but they could have treated it post by just doing a couple layers and, and cropping and blurring and things like that. Um, Fine. You've convinced me. I will take it. I've convinced you many times over the day. So it's about time. But, but to that, okay. that but, to, but to your point, it was a creative use of the natural space. So I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm just like, they could have treated it some. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. Cody? Um, could, could you do me a favor? Could you reread read the description of the category for me? I, I forgot the description. Story entered this category must show how an editor uses effects to materially enhance a story. This could be as simple as using a wipe or as complicated as creating animations with another program such as After Effects or Motion. The best entries will have a seamless integration between these elements and the rest of the edit that, enhance the, that enhances the overall story. Simply adding graphics to a story is not enough for this category. Your submission must include a write-up notifying judges about all elements. So, uh, you know, the, the um, Zoom one, it, it, it was compelling. It, it, it was good. I did feel like it was a little sloppy in, in some areas, but as far as, you know, we've all have edited tons of Zoom interviews over the past couple of years. So seeing that approach is, is, is refreshing. Um, I really did like the three artists uh, story. I thought that that one was was good, but looking at the graphic approach and and how they put it together, the one the sushi uh, uh, the sushi lady at the bottom, that graphic treatment was better, but it just did not fit the story um, in a way. But the graphic treatment was better. So, anyways, I'm just trying to go through my notes. Um, my number one would probably be the three artists, but I would like to see the the Boyd story in either a two or three. Um, I just think that it was a very clever way of doing it. I, I think I saw I saw a movie like that was based on just doing Facebook or something like that a, a couple of years ago, and it reminded me of that. And just the thought of how much work goes into that is unbelievable. So. Um, yeah, boy, the board story would be either two or three for me. And then my other uh, bank, the bank story would be either two or three. Really? Not the trash, not the trash can story. I think the, the Zoom story, it's ironic that it's like, in a way, a simpler watch and a much to make it that way is such a more complicated edit. But it got stale to me. I, I just wish it at one point we just popped out and like we're just showing that on a computer screen or whatever just to 
break it up a little bit for five ish minutes or whatever, but I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Okay, for basics, we do we agree that the um, the number one story is the story that the second story we watched about? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, all right, so that's number one. Um, are we really I vote for <clears throat> the sushi. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm it, I I am turned off by the by I mean by making her um a character, like I said, he minimizes her appearance. And I don't think it was intentional. I don't think she just understood that that's what he was doing. So are we it all ha- are we all eliminating sushi from the from the from the conversation? I am. Okay. So now we just got garbage trucks, artists, um, Mr. Mrs. Klein's greatest lesson, banks for a fuse, and Japan's most popular dog. Yeah, the Japan's most popular dog. That was cute, but then you know it was just cute. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, it didn't. I mean, it felt like a complex use of the photos. I don't know if I really cared for the emojicons from from trying to mimic Instagram. I didn't, I didn't care for that. Um, it, it showed to me that shows a lack. Oh, I'm just going to take their emojicon and, and, and multiply it and send it through as a background. Um, I didn't care for it. The, um, cause I've been on Instagram. Everyone else has, we know what that looks like. I don't need that reinforced. And then um, it just felt super simple. Not as simple. I don't know. I just didn't care. I liked the story. I don't know if the edit worked for me. And special effects. I the thought dog. the description said the dog got shot, and the whole time I was waiting for the dog. Oh my God. I swear <laughs> it said something wow. about the How disappointed are you? <laughs> that, that was the walrus a couple categories back. <laughs> 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 I could, uh, okay, I could, how about we vote? I could, I could, I could, I could live with three artists as number one. Um, yes. Banks refused to lend as number two. Boyd Cancer number. I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm always easily swayed. That's because um, I'm hungry too. Uh, Mrs. Klein's is number three. Oh, two or three, those two. I could even go garbage truck and most popular dog is both honorable mentions. And if you don't like most popular dog, then definitely garbage truck is an honorable mention. I think garbage truck deserves to be number two. Yeah, that's right. Really? really? Mm-hmm. It's so effective and it's so creative. It's just a, such a such an interesting forward thinking way to tell that story. I just, I mean, I was wowed by it. Really? I was wowed by it. I well, I yeah, well, I respect the the art and the uh, the technical ability of the one that we're giving the number one spot i appreciated more the use of art and how it was done to tell the story of why boys are boys i just i think that to me that was harder to imagine and and put into action so that i I feel that that's just required more creativity and, and thought because she the the author of the of the um, comic book one, she knew that that I mean they knew going into that that that's what they're gonna have to do because mm-hmm. it's about comic books and about women and about kids who are drawing. I mean that was a gimme. Oh okay, well this is what we're gonna have to do. Mm-hmm. But the garbage truck thing, you really had to think through how you're gonna visualize some of the aspects of it and still tell an effective story. And I think they did a beautiful job. Am I swaying you? Am I, is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I can tell you the simplicity reminded me of, oh, what was it? Was it after school kids rocks or something like the I'm just a bill. Do you guys remember that? Or am I that old? The um, that's what it kind of reminded me of. And it kind of took me back to that a little bit, you know, where he's pushing the whatever the hell the kid was pushing in mm-hmm. the cartoon um, in the story. So that's what I felt like. But it but it felt done better. It was done better done better whatever so i i agree with you there just go with it we support you yes yes (laughs) um 
then then what do you want to do with the um, other two? If that's number two. So are we all in now that garbage trucks is two? I am. I am. I can go with it. I'm good. All right. So now what's third? That's where it's hard for me because, you know, the investigative story, it was a creative use. It was appropriate use. It moved. It made it easy to understand. Like, I, I don't need to convince anybody. I just don't know. Um, I, the one I felt like the like statements that was like a solid chunk of the story where I feel like I could have done something else with that but that would be my only knock on it of just like reading off the I mean obviously like the highlighting helped but it's like, I don't know I feel like it begged for a stand-up he was already all over it how much more of David Spector do you need more. <laughs> I don't. I think his ego would thank you. Although it's probably already large, he works at FAA. Come on. <laughs> oh, that's being recorded. This is gonna really work poorly for me. But anyway, yeah, that's, anyway. whatever. <laughs> FAA is, you know, it's about to break off from, uh, you know, the whole thing of Tegna anyway. So it doesn't. Matter. I'll just save you. Yeah. Um. I don't know. It was fine. I. I just don't. I didn't love I didn't I don't know why I'd, the Mrs. Klein's I, it was hard for me to like connect and I don't know why um I, I don't know I will take myself out of the voting person out of the voting on the on this on the number three because I'm also affected by the Boyd and Kanzer story um because I saw it right after he announced to us at the conference that he had cancer so all 20 something of us, when we were watching this story, we bawled our eyes out because we saw parallels with him and everybody has a connection with him, you know, no, no matter if it's personal or just admiring him from afar. So I will, I've contributed to my decision on the one, number one and two, I feel good about it, but you guys decide on the three and the honorable mention because I'm attached. So I, go ahead. I feel like the graphics in the banks refused to lend amplified the story more than the theme and, and approach for Mrs. Klein's. Okay, so Cody and yeah. Anthony, are you good with banks refused the third? Yeah, I am, especially after, after, after that, because it did, it enhanced it. And Mrs. Klein, it didn't detract, but it felt right at the same time. And then is there an honorable mention, either Klein or Japan's most popular dog? I would say Klein. Yeah. Yeah. Klein. yeah. Okay, so nothing for Japan, right? Well, can you, can you, are you, no, she's not, I'll talk about that yet. Okay. Yeah, no. Just like. I mean. The, the points made about Wait, Mrs. Oh. Klein's is, is legit. It was that's a hard edit or it's a hard shoot or re, whatever the hell they did. It was hard to do because you have to time that out and everything. And that was hard. Yeah. So um, whether he slowed it up, slowed it down, whatever he did, it matched. And, and that's hard to do. It wasn't as pretty as I would have liked it, but it's still incredibly hard to do. Okay, so just making sure we're all on the same page. Three artists is first. Garbage trucks and gender development is second. Banks refused to lend third and Miss Klein honorable mention. 